something going on in the newsroom, which is where Carolyn Stokes is with today's news. Carolyn. All right, thank you, Anthony. I'm Carolyn Stokes in the CBC newsroom while our studio is under construction. And we begin tonight with news from the courts. The verdict is in. A jury found Al Potter guilty of first degree murder in the death of Dale Porter. Arianna Kelland reports. For the first time during the four week trial, happy tears from the family of Dale Porter. Turning directly to the jury, a slight smile on his face, 55 year old Al Potter hears the verdict guilty of first degree murder. And Justice Garrett Handrigan didn't waste any time delivering the mandatory sentence life imprisonment with no chance of parole for 25 years. A victory for the prosecutors who made the case that Porter's 2014 stabbing death was planned and deliberate. Very happy for the family. This was a long ordeal for them. It was four, almost four and a half years ago that their uh, brother uh, father was killed. So it's, we're very happy for them. A long ordeal for the RCMP too. Some members who investigated the case and testified wept when they heard the verdict. Mounties called an unexpected news conference shortly after the jury's decision. Outlaw motorcycle gangs, such as the Vikings Motorcycle Club, threaten the safety and well-being of our communities through their involvement in the illicit drug trade and the violence they use to further their criminal interests. This murder was a tragic example of that violence and committed to benefit and was committed to benefit the Vikings Motorcycle Club. Dale Porter's homicide remained unsolved for more than two years. As undercover tapes captured, Al Potter believed he was long off the hook. But it was that conversation and confession which led to this day, the first murder conviction for a known biker gang member. Membership in, uh, in uh, the Vikings Motorcycle Club uh, has been fluid, uh, so it, there's an ebb and flow to it. So there are probably several members that are uh, currently in existence with the Vikings Motorcycle Club at this time. A trial is still to come for some alleged members of the Vikings Motorcycle Club, and another man is heading to trial in September for Porter's death. Dale Porter's son, Tyler, was a young teenager when his dad was killed. He made it to court today, just in time to see the man who killed him led away in handcuffs. During his two days on the stand, Al Potter was adamant it was an act of self-defense, fending off a man who just wouldn't drop a knife. It's a story the 12-person jury didn't buy. Al Potter will be eligible for parole when he's 81. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. And testimony at the Trent Butt murder trial focused on the fire at his home the day his daughter was found dead inside. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. The fire commissioner who investigated the blaze at Trent Butt's home in 2016 says it was clearly a case of arson. My conclusion is that this fire was intentionally lit by a person, said Jim Barry, an expert in fire progression and the origin of fires. Barry said the burn patterns in the house show two separate fires were set at 12 Hayden Heights, the house where Trent Butt's daughter, Quinn Butt, was found. A Crown lawyer also said DNA collected from three gas cans, a lighter and a box cutter found at the scene matched Butt's DNA. Butt is accused of first-degree murder and arson. He has pleaded guilty to arson, but not guilty to first-degree murder. The Crown is arguing Butt killed his daughter and then burned down his home in Carboneer to punish his estranged wife, Andrea Goss. They pointed to what they described as a murder-suicide letter found in Butt's truck after the fire. The defense says Butt didn't plan to kill his daughter and doesn't remember doing it. The trial is set to resume on Monday. It was expected to take three weeks, but is progressing more quickly than planned. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, it's International Women's Day and events are happening all across the province to mark the occasion. In St. John's, the International Women's Forum hosted a breakfast at Cougar Helicopters. The event featured a panel discussion on science, technology, engineering and math moderated by Noreen Golfman. Now, Golfman is provost and VP of Memorial University. She's also the founder of the St. John's International Women's Film Festival, which is in its 30th year. 
Golfman was named Woman of the Year by the Performers Union Actra. She feels equality in the workforce has improved over the years, but gender parity is still a long way off. There's a whole vocabulary that didn't exist, and you kind of find out the hard way about how you might be disadvantaged or the subtle ways in which you might be excluded or not taken seriously. I think now younger women know that. It's part of their naturalization. Doesn't mean that they're necessarily better prepared to deal with it in those moments, but um, at least there is a frame of reference for them. And international Women's Day events were also held all around the world. In Spain, there was a call for more equality and better pay. In Kenya, women rallied in the streets demanding an end to gender-based violence. In the Philippines, women demanded the resignation of the country's controversial and many say sexist president. In France, protesters demanded the release of human rights activists jailed in Saudi Arabia for fighting for women's rights. Thousands gathered in Turkey and in Russia, several hundred activists gathered to draw attention to domestic violence. Today is a national holiday there and is widely celebrated with gifts of flowers. Boy, is it chilly outside right now. We've been seeing on and off snow squalls for most of this uh, Avalon as well as the Buren and the Conagra Peninsula. That's where we've got some snow squall watches as we head into the evening and overnight hours tonight. Temperatures are actually going to climb as we head towards uh, Saturday and Sunday, which is certainly good news. We do have a couple of blizzard warnings up through Labrador. I'll have all those details, your full weekend forecast when I come back. Carolyn? Thanks, Ashley. Well, the Beaver Brook Antimony Mine in Glenwood is back in business thanks to new investments from China. The state-owned China Min Metals Rare Earth Group is the new backer for the company that stopped production in 2013. This new phase will mean 100 jobs for the area, with the mine producing 160,000 tons per year when in full production. The expected lifespan for the mine is three and a half years. So in Newfoundland and Labrador, we see our province as a world of possibilities at our doorsteps because the geology positions Newfoundland and Labrador to be a global supplier of minerals, particularly while we are advancing a green economy. And the idled shipyard in Marystown is now in the hands of businessman Paul Antle and a Norwegian company. The partnership Marbase Marystown Incorporated has bought the shipyard from Kiewit. Antle says he's been interested in the shipyard for a year and a half and jumped at the chance to buy it. The sale will now go to the province for approval, opening the door for more jobs on the Buren Peninsula. An online group is helping students in Happy Valley Goose Bay look their best on graduation day after many graduation dresses were destroyed in a fire. Here now's Jacob Barker has more. It's an important dress for an important time of life. Getting all your pictures and your dress and your tux to have memories of that moment is really special. Kelly Butt of Lake Melville School in Northwest River traveled all the way to St. John's to pick her graduation dress out here in Goose Bay. The options are thin. A lot of people is on a budget for their graduation, so to lose your dress like that, it's really hard. It didn't fit quite right, so she took it in for alterations. That was just last week. Watching pictures of the fire, it didn't dawn on her until her mom pointed it out. And that's when it clicked that I didn't have a dress anymore, and my grad is in just under two months. It was really hard. I had a cry. <laughs> but posted about her loss to Facebook, Ashley Coles, a former Goose Bay grad, saw it. I thought, like, if that was me, I would be absolutely devastated. Coles posted a picture of her dress to a Facebook page, offering it up for anybody who wanted it. Like, if, if it would be a better use to someone rather than going and spending another two or $300 on a dress that wasn't even the first one that they wanted, it was kind of be like a second choice of a dress, then I thought that maybe someone might have a use for mine. Many followed suit. Post after post, dress after dress. Butt's friend Paige Michelin wanted to start a Facebook group to help everybody looking for a dress. At 300 members and climbing, it's working. It's like really overwhelming that all these girls were donating their dresses and it was really nice. Well, Butt will be getting a new dress paid for by her sister. 
She has decided to donate a formal dress from her closet to the cause. And I decided that I didn't need it anymore, so I might as well go to someone in need. It's an uncertain future for the seamstress shop, which was destroyed. The girls have a message for its owner, April Williams. I know she must feel hurt that all these people lost their dresses and suits and stuff, but this, it's not really her fault. It's all she can do, but my heart really goes out to her. The girls hope the interest in the group will continue on in the future for anyone in Labrador who may need grad clothes for any reason. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Well, CBC and L received a nice pat on the back today. We were handed a community award for a series of stories on the sexual exploitation of young people. The award comes from the folks at the Coalition Against the Sexual Exploitation of Youth. Their so-called Casey Awards recognize the work of the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary and the media for their efforts to build trust with people in the sex trade and survivors of sexual exploitation. In particular, the award for CBCNL highlighted last year's series, Stealing Innocence, from host Ramona Deering. A few years ago, I actually participated in a training for survivors on how to deal with the media. The main messages were the media is not your friend, they do not care, and they just want to tell the story that will sell the best. But that's their job. But CBC has proven to me and others that the media can go above and beyond the call of duty. They can approach stories in a sensitive manner and get it right. Ramona's stealing innocent peace did just that. Never before had the lives and stories of people with lived experience been shared in such a way. The long-term impact on the people interviewed and the viewers has been amazing. Bray is from Bahamas and Melissa's from South Africa. For some reason, the ice and the snow appeals to a lot of people who are learning how to skate for the first time, really. Stay tuned, we're live from the loop.
Welcome back, live to the loop. Kind of a special here and now feature as, uh, what are they doing in the studio? Fumigating? <laughs> anyway, they're doing something in our studio, so we're out here and Carolyn's in the newsroom, as you know. The weather, it's uh, it's brisk here. Come join us at the loop if you're in St. John's. Hot chocolate's Hot chocolate on us. It's delicious. And you'll want it. How, it's cold. It's chilly out right now. We're sitting uh, around, I believe minus nine last time I checked. Factor in the wind chill, because that's what's getting yep. feeling really cold. Uh, it is definitely feeling cold, but uh, let's take a look at the weather uh, heading into Saturday. The update is brought to you by 811 Healthline. Medical advice, health information, mental health, and healthy eating. Dial 811. It's free and confidential. Temperatures today not too bad across the province, sitting where we have been for the past little bit, generally in the minus single digits. Up through Labrador, those temperatures a little bit cooler as well into the minus teens. Lab City sitting at about minus 16 this afternoon. Now, uh, the snow squalls are going to continue as we head through the night tonight. We still do have those watches for most of the Avalon, the Beer and Peninsula. Uh, and including the Conagra Peninsula as we head through the overnight tonight. We can see that as we take a look at the future tracker that we'll see that potential for uh, some snow squalls, even some onshore flurries along the west coast. But the story uh, really is up through Labrador, that low pressure system that's been sitting off the coast of Labrador for the past couple of days is going to bring more snow along with that tonight and some windy conditions, which is leading to some blizzard warnings. So uh, through the over Overnight, generally looking at those temperatures for anywhere along the south shore of Newfoundland is likely going to see those temperatures climb by morning. So about minus six for Port Basque, minus three for Marystown. St. John's will sit around minus eight tonight. Those winds will be uh, breezy out of the west near 50 kilometers per hour. Uh, as we head towards central, though, uh, that potential force and flurries tonight as well into the minus teens. Same for Cornerbrook and then St. Anthony looking at minus 12. There's those blizzard conditions along coastal Labrador with winds gusting upwards of about 100 kilometers per hour overnight tonight and about 5 to 10 centimeters of snow. And then Lab City much cooler at minus 29 with uh or rather minus 27 with that potential for a few flurries now here's a look at your accumulations as we head towards saturday night the most will be around the COVID. could pick up an additional 10 to 15 centimeters by the time saturday night rolls around but we will start to see conditions improving through the afternoon for these areas in the blizzard warning uh, through the day tomorrow and that's because that snow will eventually taper off towards sunday and you can see that as that low pushes off most of Saturday, though, for the island will be uh, or looking at that risk of flurries through the day, eventually clearing out towards the evening hours. That's certainly good news, but those temperatures are going to be significantly warmer. So southwest winds near 40 kilometers per hour, about minus one in St. John's with that risk of flurries. We're looking at flurries across the board. Grand Falls, Windsor at about minus two, same for Gander and Harbor Breton. And then towards the coast, again, that risk of flurries, those temperatures are gonna be sitting in the minus single digits, minus five for Cornerbrook with those southwest winds near 40 kilometers per hour. Now the winds will pick up as we head towards uh, Sunday morning for most of the west coast, but through the afternoon, you're looking at gusts around uh, 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. And then up through Labrador, those winds will die down, taper to flurries, which is certainly good news, but take a look at those temperatures. Minus six for Nain, minus eight for Happy Valley Goose Bay, and then Lab City a little bit warmer as well at minus 14. So that's a look at your forecast. When I come back, we'll have uh, the details on the rest of your weekend forecast. I've got two third year, year engineering students with me now, I'm starting to stutter because it's a bit cold out here. Uh, Brody, uh, what are you doing here tonight? Uh, just coming for a break from school. Break coming from school? Yep. Yeah. It's not too cold for you? No, it's just fine. All right, Rachel, uh, you're pretty sturdy. No hat, I notice. Yeah, I forgot my hat, but nice little study break. Uh, all right, good. so when do you guys hit the books again? Half hour. You know? <laughs> In a half hour. Okay, well, listen, I hope you have a good time. Make sure to grab a hot chocolate and. Uh, be careful out there. I know she, I'm not sure you got helmets you're supposed to, but uh, maybe you lend her your hat. Yeah, all right. Thanks. All right, take it easy. Sweet. All right, you too? Yeah, thanks. Now, if you're in the Loop area of St. John's, head on down. The hot chocolate's on us. Having a bit of fun here on a Friday night as they renovate, fumigate, whatever they're doing at the Here Now studio. And uh, we'll have more from the Loop a little bit later. Thanks, Anthony. Well, a new place for people to come together and be creative officially opened in St. John's today. Organizers say the space aims to help improve the community's mental health. 
Today is the official launch of the Hearthstone Community Archive Studio. And what it means is um, we have a home and that our programming can actually become more comprehensive and, um, and more prolific. The therapeutic part is a complex thing, but it's also very simple. It's sometimes just sitting with people and just making art. And uh, sometimes it you know, can evoke some pretty you know, deep emotional things. But mostly and overall, I think it is an incredible catalyst, community engagement catalyst. We're not a clinical program, but we are a community program that focuses on using creativity, art making, as a vessel for connecting that is grounded in um, sort of grassroots idea of wellness and improved mental health and, and pushing against isolation and marginalization. It is a very transformative experience in a way that you hardly notice until you notice it. Week by week, our programming changes um, and it's going to continue to change based on uh, community input and need. Um, so we will be open for the hours that people want us to be open for. We can set up the whole room as we see fit. Uh, we can put up all the art we want. We can stuff the cupboards full of materials and uh, we can just keep on going and keep in, you know, inviting people to come and make art whoever they are, as they are. And uh, that's the basis, I think, for me. One of the hot topics at this year's home show is something called Net Zero Homes. We'll find out what that is coming up and how it can help you save on your electricity bill.
the business that began with one little girl and one orphan duck. A sure thing, Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. Welcome back to Here and Now. I'm here at the Glacier in Mount Pearl where the annual home show will be getting underway tomorrow. So if you're building a home, if you're renovating or landscaping, this event is designed for you. And one of the big topics these days, of course, is electricity costs, how to be more energy efficient. And joining me now is someone who knows a lot about this. This is Andy Oding. And Andy, you're in the province to do some training with That's some right. local builders about net zero building. Can you explain what that is? Yeah, so the net zero home is a concept that you could actually build and construct a home that would be capable of producing as much energy as it uses over the course of a whole year. So we're talking about homes that are nice and airtight. These homes had exceptionally high levels of insulation. They have fresh air machines, uh, state-of-the-art HRVs or ERVs. They have really good windows, spectacularly energy efficient windows, three panes of glass. They have special mechanicals that are right size so that it keeps the temperatures even from top to bottom. So those are some of the things that they have in them. Okay, and how, how does it get to net zero? Like this term net zero, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, so the building codes, the provinces have gotten together with the federal government and about two years ago, they decided that energy costs are going up. We do have concerns about this greenhouse gas emission. And the idea was that maybe by the year 2030, 2040, we might be able to make homes existing and new so efficient that they would operate that you could produce a little bit of energy on the house through solar or what have you and at the end of the year you would actually produce the same or more than what you actually use in the house over the course of the year so that's the direction some of the building codes are moving right now so this program picks it up and it challenges the builder to actually build to these future levels now and the good news is you've got a whole slew of builders here mm -hmm. in newfoundland um, here today, six, seven, eight builders who are all qualified and ready to do this. What yeah. other things could someone add to their home to get it to net zero? To net zero, so the first thing you want to do, the building science that Canadians have known for 50 years is first of all, get the energy use down in the home. So just build a better house. After you get the loads down a little bit, less heating, less cooling, then you start to generate. So you could do solar, you can do solar thermal. You could do a wind turbine in the backyard if you want, or on the roof of the house, or a small hydroelectric dam in the backyard. But generally, it comes down to photovoltaics or solar because that's really the go-to resource we have right now. Okay, so this is designed to save money in the long term, but it does sound expensive to start. How does that work? Yeah, that's an interesting question because affordability is a huge concern with the home builders, and it's a concern with us as homeowners. It's fascinating when you look at what's called total cost of ownership, right? You're mortgage expense and the expense to run the house and you put those together that's called total cost of ownership some of the builders in newfoundland has found is if they can spend let's say 10 12 fifteen thousand dollars to make a home net zero ready or a little more to make it full net zero with solar is that you may have a house where you're spending less than a thousand maybe less than five hundred dollars a year in utility costs that means you actually now have a mortgage plus your utility costs that cost you less on a monthly basis than just building the code of course, in this province, there are lots of concerns about electricity costs oh, with yes. Muskrat Falls uh, coming on stream and fears that the price of electricity could double. Uh, do you think that you're going to see a lot of interest in this whole idea of net zero uh, at the home show this um, weekend? I'll have to say I don't think we will. From what we're hearing from the builders here and from the industry is there already is interest. Because when you talk about homes this year and in the future costing a typical homeowner a two-story single detached home to maybe cost you four, five, six, seven thousand dollars just to run over a year and now you have the opportunity to only spend a thousand or five hundred dollars a year to do that that gets everybody's attention. Okay, well, the home show gets underway tomorrow morning, That's right? That's right. I'm sure you'll be getting a lot of questions from the public about net zero homes. Yeah, <laughs> and the best thing I would advise is look for the Canadian Home Builders logo on the builder site. Those builders can talk to the clients about what net zero is. They can answer questions. I will say probably some of the best building science based builders that we have in Canada are actually based out of Newfoundland. So you have a good group here. Okay, Andy Oding, thank you so much. Thank you, <laughs> it's a pleasure. So Dre, have you actually been skating for a long time? No, this is my first time. First time ever? First time ever. Okay, so in your country, where are you from again? The Bahamas. Well, uh, okay, well I'll teach you how to stop a little later. So I'll just get you in here and you're from? South Africa. Okay, I'll come back to you in a second. So Bahamas to St. John, well tell me your story. How'd you come here? 
Well, I came here to go to Marine Institute to do nautical science, to work on, you know, the ships, to get training on working on oil tankers, cargo ships, so on. So I know that Memorial University Marine Institute had some of the most competitive rates, so why not, you know? Okay. Yeah. And so uh, the, the trade-off, though, is the weather, right? Because I hear the Bahamas, not bad. No, 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 <laughs> not bad at all. As, as cold as it's going to get, it's probably 16 degrees, and people are bringing out their winter coats on that, right? <laughs> so yeah. uh, how would you get interested in skating? Well, uh, I got a couple of buddies in my class. They're pretty good hockey players, and uh, one of them just, you know, offered to let me get skates to, like, try it out once or twice. So I uh, figured I'd probably give it a go, you know? Yeah, you can't yeah. beat it. May as well join it, right? Might as well. All right, I'll hand the mic over to uh, Ashley here, and you can talk to our friend from South Africa. Right, you're from South Africa. Your yes. name is Melissa Keats, correct? Yes. And yes. what are you doing here? Uh, I'm doing biology at Mund. Is this your first time on skates? Uh, actually, no. I have skated before, but... Uh, uh, not very frequently, so <laughs> I figured it would be a fun activity to do together. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Getting out on the loop already, just from the little that I've done today, it is a very different uh, type of skating than it ask, is. Ask her how to stop. Oh. Um, uh, all I know is that uh, you might have to make like a pizza. I'm not really good at that yet, but <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out. It's the same with skiing. You pizza <laughs> down and then straight ahead. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, I hope you're enjoying it. All right, yeah, it's been fun so far. <laughs> yeah. so, so, Dre, when you're actually, when you're back home in Bahamas, what, uh, what are the sports you actually do that you have a lot of experience in? Well, I was on the Bahamas National Water Polo Team, so that was like six times a week, two hours a day, every day, you know. So, uh, yeah, that was my main thing, water polo and swimming. Water polo and swimming are much different than skating, right? A lot different from skating. Yeah. Have, have any of your family from Bahamas, they visited you Newfoundland Labrador yet? Uh, my dad and granddad dropped me off about two years ago, and nobody's come up since. But, like, I keep in contact. <laughs> you contact wonder why? So. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But I, I visit, like, three times a year, like yeah. Christmas break, reading week sometimes, like, for a few days, yeah. over the summer if I could. I, I can yeah. imagine, you know, if the wind chills sort of minus 20, I should kind of say, you know what, Dre, you come to us. Uh, instead yeah. of us coming to you. Yeah, that's pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, I, I don't want to interrupt your skate, so I'll let you guys uh, head on to where you are. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. All right, and hopefully uh, you'll learn how to stop. So maybe just skate off there, and my cameraman, Eddie, will see you, and we'll give it a whirl, all right? <laughs> off we go. Are we all going? Okay. A story that needs to be told, a story that needs to be felt, I think they're going to see something brand new, new faces, new ideas, new voices, and maybe, uh, maybe a story that's new to them. Meet the diverse cast behind the play Remnants that's ahead.
Meet Caleb. I blame the doctors for it. I blame God. I was mad about the things that I didn't say and what, you know, things I could go back and change, the memories that we never got to make. Listen up. Thursdays on your local CBC Morning Show. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, diversity is taking center stage at the LSPU Hall in St. John's. The play Remnants is loosely based on a garment factory fire from 1911 and the lives of the many young immigrant workers who work there. It's good. Yeah, we'll do that tonight too. Don't forget when I think they're going to see something brand new and not just that it's a premiere of a new show, uh, but they're going to see new faces, new ideas, new voices and maybe uh, maybe a story that's new to them uh, and I also hope that they'll be inspired to think about um, some of the choices that they make in particular when it comes to to fashion and buying uh, you know the, the, their next outfit. My name is Nabila Qureshi and uh, I'm a master's student here at Community Health and uh, I'm originally from India and I've been living in St. John's for just over 10 years. I am Vanessa Cardoso, I'm from Brazil and I'm here for four years and a half. I'm a clown, a um, dancer, a multicultural artist. My name is Karen Money. I'm from Cameroon and I'm a writer, actor, director and producer. My name is Nora Barker, I'm originally from Grand Falls, Windsor. Um, I would call myself an aspiring actor, I just finished my uh, degree at MUN and I'm just starting to dip my toes in the arts community here. So, 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 so. Esther Lukowski is, um, she's basically, so, I guess you can call so, her the activist, so, the one who's trying to so, uh, rally up the women in the workplace uh, so that they could fight for better rights uh, in terms of pay, working conditions, all of that. And she deliver these along with those uniforms to Miss Potter's. As soon as they graduate, that's what they'll be forced to wear next. It's a lot like learning about ourselves as much as learning about the other people. You know, um, building relationships offset, offset, and um, that's kind of helped us to um, to build these characters that have a connection, help it look as real and truthful as I imagine the writer and the director meant for it to be. You should appreciate then now you see the work. It's challenging because the language, but I have a lot of support from the the whole team. I feel very lucky to be uh, with the incredible women and talent people and really helping. Oh, so, so, so. It's a tragic story, like ultimately in the end, but there's a lot of really beautiful moments between these women who mm. work together, um, maybe in not the best conditions, but a lot of the times these characters would make the best of uh, where they were working. So there are moments of joy and laughter, and I hope that they're able to take that out of it as much as you know the ultimate ending Message. yeah yeah now to some national news one man struggling to find housing in Toronto came up with a unique solution of his own he didn't want to live in a shelter so he built his own Lorenda Redekop reports welcome to Chateau Dan open up and you can See inside, it's fairly rudimentary, but it's well insulated. This is where his friend Dan now sleeps, all his own idea. Dan's always been a pretty sharp and inventive guy. And all of a sudden he announced that I'm going to build myself a house. There's a fold down bed, lights, heating, and a catchy name. The cramper, because it's kind of like a camper and the space is a little cramped. Dan himself didn't want to be identified, but did agree to an interview. He created this to solve his own housing problem, well aware of the dangers of sleeping on the streets. I just didn't want to become a statistic, but I also didn't want to become someone in a shelter or a respite center. I can close the door at night, I can lock it. It is relatively safe in here. It's mobile, built on old bicycle wheels. He wheels it around and stays on friends' properties. The metal base is part of an old ladder. All right, so it is called the cramper for a reason, but I can almost stand up in there with this peaked roof. There aren't any windows, though. Do you think this could be considered illegal, actually? Probably in somebody's eyes. Somebody's going to find um, a reason that 
no, it won't work. It's just one example of unusual shelter ideas to get people off the streets. In Oregon, they've created fast-build mini-homes that resemble covered wagons. In the Yukon, it's tiny homes for the homeless. In Vaughan, they're turning old buses into shelters. Housing advocates say Dan's invention is creative, but not the answer to end homelessness. Or it's the best solution for a really terrible situation. And I think that Torontonians, while they may be excited by this, probably know in their heart of hearts that this is nowhere near good enough and that we really, really need to have people housed. Dan is now thinking about a new and improved version. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the dragon has landed. A capsule from Elon Musk's SpaceX splashed down in the Atlantic today, right on time. The return of the Crew Dragon capsule ends a seven-day mission to the International Space Station. A SpaceX rocket launched the capsule last Saturday. The Crew Dragon spent five days at the space station, dropping off 180 kilograms of test equipment before flying itself back to Earth. The only passengers were a dummy covered in sensors and a stuffed toy of the Earth. SpaceX is planning a crewed space flight in June. And the small but fierce looking killer whale is causing major excitement in the science world. Yes, yes, yes. Marine biologists are thrilled at discovering a new species of orca whales. This video taken off the coast of Chile confir confirms what fishermen have been saying for years. There's a killer whale here that just doesn't look like the rest of them. This fish has a small white eye patch, a round head, and a thin, sharper dorsal fin. At eight meters long, it's also smaller than typical killer whales. Biologists say these whales remained a mystery because they live in mo the most inhospitable waters on the planet. They call it a stunning and welcome discovery as killer whales are increasingly a threatened species. Hey, Chrissy. 
Hey, you ready to go for our big night out? What's going on? I thought we were going out. It's freezing out. It's winter. Come on, aren't you ready? We talked about this. I've got dinner reservations, tickets to the show. It's time to go. Come on, let's get the stink of house off you. All right, bye. Tune in to the St. John's Morning Show to win restaurant vouchers, tickets, and other things that'll force you to leave the house. Come on, we're gonna be late, Chrissy. Night out. Yes, come on, I gotta get the stink of house off you. So is it just me or is the wind picking up a little bit or what do you think? I don't know. Since we've been skating around, I feel a little bit warmer, so I can't really feel that yeah, wind. But yeah. I'm gonna feel all that's the hot chocolate talking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, so obviously it's Friday night, and on Fridays people always want to get a sense of what's gonna happen for the weekend. So that's right. what do you got? So once we get through Saturday's forecast, which uh, is showing a little bit of snow for most places, let's take a look at Sunday's forecast. Well, as we head into Sunday, once we get some flurries through the overnight over with, Big Ridge of high pressure moves in and there's not a whole lot happening through the day. Those winds will certainly ease into the afternoon with uh, plenty of sunshine, it looks like. Here's a look at your temperatures. Back to around seasonal, about minus one for St. John's, one degree in Grand Falls, Windsor. We could even see these temperatures, uh, especially with the sunshine hovering uh, around the zero degree mark or even above for most areas. Now, I do have snow in the forecast for Port of Ask and Lab City. That's because the next system will roll in and we're going to see that potential for some flurries, but not until uh, at least closer to Monday morning, uh, but definitely remember that those clocks will spring forward uh, at 3 a.m. on Sunday. So definitely uh, keep that in mind. But as far as what we're going to see weather wise, we are going to get into a little bit of a colder pattern towards Tuesday and Wednesday, and then another thaw will move in for Thursday. So if we can get the next couple of days out of the way, uh, definitely into some good news. So here's our next weather maker that will move in Monday afternoon. We'll see generally a transition from snow to rain for most, if not all of Newfoundland. And then Labrador will be sitting in uh, the snow at least through the day on Monday. And even into Tuesday as that system rolls off and then uh, Tuesday morning, especially for the Avalon in eastern Newfoundland, we are looking at that risk of uh, rain. And that's because those temperatures are really going to jump up and continue uh, at least through the day on uh, Tuesday. And then, like I said, we'll get into that colder pattern for Wednesday. And then it doesn't look like too much is going to happen after that. And that's because uh, we'll see a little bit of a high pressure move in. So here's a look at the next five days. Saturday, tomorrow, uh, some southwest winds gusting near 60 kilometers per hour with that chance of flurry. Sunday looks absolutely gorgeous with those temperatures hovering around minus one. Then we get into that transition. Snow to rain, windy conditions, and then late day Tuesday, after we get that four degree high, we'll see that potential for some uh, snow again and continue through the day on Wednesday. For central Newfoundland, similar forecast, but one degree for Sunday with those winds easing. That's definitely good news. Monday, so, uh, some snow to rain, and then we're looking at that flurry dropping back down below zero as we head towards midweek. Western Newfoundland, minus five tomorrow with sunshine and plus one on Sunday. Again, could see these temperatures fluctuate a degree or two depending on uh, the situation with the sun. And then snow to rain on Monday, and then Tuesday, again, that return of uh, that flurry activity. Eastern Labrador, nice day on Sunday with that temperature climbing to about minus three. Snow moving in for both Monday and Tuesday, but generally sitting in the minus single digits. And then we'll see a similar forecast for Western Labrador. A little cool tomorrow at minus 14, climbing nicely as we head towards the beginning of next week. And then uh, again into Wednesday with a return of that sunshine. This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Okay, well, uh, the weekend looks a little warmer than it is right now. I got a guy here who can put the cold in perspective. Hey, Lucas, what yep. brings you here? Um, nothing. Uh, I was just home bored and just start watching TV, and so I just start. I uh, decided to flick on CBC News, and they give enough free hot savvy, so I decided to come out and enjoy a cup for the night. Right now, you don't straight. Yeah. You're not a townie, are you? No, I'm from um, Labrador. Labrador from? Uh, Nain. From Nain, okay, yep. so you've heard me complain about the cold. What do you think of this? Um, no, if you're, if, as long as you got your cap on, and um, um, it's pretty good for me, but not for other people, it's not. 
Yeah. All right. Yeah. Are you enjoying your hot chocolate? Yes, it's really okay. good. So what advice do you have for people to stay warm? Because you know what it's like to be cold. Yeah, just stay warm and just keep walking. Just don't, just don't them. Um, just don't sit down and just, just keep go for a run or just keep walk. moving. Yep. Just don't stay still when you're when you're out. Okay. Yeah. Listen, Lucas, enjoy the hot chocolate. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for watching. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. That's yep. uh, Lucas. Yeah. And as you know, tonight, a bit of a different kind of show, and I'll let things go back to the newsroom with Carolyn Stokes and more stories in the news. Yeah. You. Thank you, Anthony. Well, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in Iqaluit today to officially acknowledge an injustice inflicted on Indigenous people there. The CBC's Jordan Koenig explains. Inuit across the north have been waiting for decades to hear these words. To the people who were sent south, we are sorry. We are sorry for forcing you from your families, for not showing you the respect and care you deserved. We are sorry for your pain. To the people whose loved ones were taken away, we are sorry. From the 1940s till the 1960s, Inuit were taken from their homes and families south for TB treatment. Many never returned up to today. Their loved ones still don't know where they are buried. The Prime Minister announced the Nanilabut Initiative, a database to find those graves. But Alice Ipkangnek of Rankin Inlet says some may never find their loved ones' bodies. Kangnek says the nurses did whatever they wanted with the patients. They would either throw their bodies somewhere deep underground or their bodies were cremated. Why? I don't understand why they did that. I used to think that maybe their infections from TB was too great to handle. So they burnt their bodies and maybe they put the less infectious ones underground without putting a cross on their burials. There were counselors in the room to help people with their painful memories as they remember what they lost and suffered for so many years. Some Inuit that I spoke to say Prime Minister coming in person to apologize was important so that they can move forward for all the wrongdoings of the federal government. Jordan Kunni, CBC News, Kalui. Well, the federal court today ruled against SNC-Lavalin in its efforts to avoid criminal prosecution. The engineering firm wanted the court to review a decision not to enter into a remediation agreement, but the court ruled that the appeal was outside its jurisdiction. The company faces charges of bribery related to its business in Libya. The Prime Minister's office is accused of improperly pressuring the former Attorney General to drop the criminal proceedings. A remediation agreement would hold SNC-Lavalin to account for wrongdoing without a formal finding of guilt. The government could still opt for an agreement instead of prosecution. And the family of billionaire philanthropists Barry and Honey Sherman want to demolish the Toronto home where the two were murdered. In an application to the city, an agent representing the family says the house has bad memories and stigma because of the incident. No one will buy it as it stands, the letter states. Family members want to level the house, clean up the site and sell it. The Shermans were found dead near the indoor pool of their Toronto home in December 2017.
Happy 50th anniversary today to Walter and Linda Janes of Port Kerwin. And George and Joan Maynard of Cornerbrook, they celebrated 62 years of marriage this past Tuesday. Congratulations. And a happy 93rd birthday to Annie Boland of Mount Pearl. She celebrated last Sunday. And happy birthday to Major Ray Stratton, who turned 93 yesterday. And a happy 91st birthday to Pierce Penny. Pierce is from Great Bra on the Northern Peninsula and now lives in St. John's. Happy 91st birthday to June Osmond, who celebrated last Sunday. Happy 90th birthday to Helen McGraw from Patrick's Cove, now living in St. John's. Happy 63rd wedding anniversary to Ray and Betty Hussey in Mount Pearl. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Gabriel and Winnie Parsons of Fortune. They will celebrate March 13th. Betty and Bryant Carter of Brigus celebrated their 57th wedding anniversary on Wednesday. Congratulations. And happy 68th wedding anniversary to Walter and Phyllis Chaffee of Musgrave Town. Wishing Lewis and Elsie Bungay of Seal Cove, Fortune Bay, a very happy 67th wedding anniversary. And a happy 90th birthday to Elizabeth Hodder in Shoal Harbor. And birthday greetings to Wallace Vardy in Harbor Mill, Fortune Bay, now living in Grand Falls, Windsor. He turns 91 tomorrow. Happy birthday as well to Dennis Dre of Dunville on his 97th birthday. That was on March the 5th. Happy birthday to Ida Eastman of port who will turn 90 tomorrow. Happy birthday to Jean Shea of Bishop's Falls, now living in Stephenville. Jean will be 90 this Monday. And another 90th birthday to celebrate. Happy 90th to Florence Breen of St. John's. And happy 53rd wedding anniversary to Jack and Hilda Penny of St. John's, who will celebrate this Tuesday. We're going to wind things down here from our live special Friday night at the Loop with a certain gentleman here. Yeah, he just showed up. Ray Penton, <laughs> Bond Street. I'm what they call the two-legged Zamboni. <laughs> I'm here to scrape the snow off the ice for the uh, people that skate here at night. Okay, so you volunteer? A volunteer since it started, yeah. Okay, well listen, I don't want to get in your way and there's some snow over there, so get shoveling. All right, <laughs> All right off you go, off you go. So uh, let's, let's bring Carolyn back into this. I'm just getting us over where we're supposed to be. So uh, it's been quite the night. It, it sounds like you guys are having a lot of fun down there tonight. And it looks like a beautiful evening, too. It's beautiful, but I tell you, after an hour. It's a little <laughs> yeah, chilly. <laughs> I kind of feel it. I've never, I've never had so many tears of joy in my entire life, actually. <laughs> I miss you, Carolyn. <laughs> anyway, we're going to go now. Have a great oh, weekend. Have a good weekend, everyone. <laughs> Good night, everyone. <laughs> Go that way.